This is a commentary on telepresence, a concept of Robert Ballard the Explorer, and not a commentary on current events that he was speaking about out of respect to the families uh, of those who deceased. Robert Ballard had a very interesting set of meetings that he had with the media recently. I call them meetings because it kind of felt like he was having kind of like a, almost like a discussion or a, a teachable moment more than an interview. And uh, he is one of the few experts on submersibles in the world. But what caught my ear was that he emphasized the idea of telepresence, which is his concept for using a robotic craft on the bottom of the ocean whenever possible to alleviate risk, and also, in his eyes, is just as good as going down on a manned craft. Now, this may be a little bit uh, biased. He, he actually has had the experiences of going down into what he called the freezing cold depths in a craft that is very cramped, takes hours to get down there. And, uh, well, he did get the wonder and the excitement of using these manned craft alongside ROVs later on uh, for decades. But that's what caught my ear. If someone is an expert in a field, why would they willingly give up that expertise as being one of the few people in the world to get to experience it? So willingly. And almost like with enthusiasm of, of someone who's who's truly has a passion for something. And I, I as I dug deeper, I went back uh, 11 years, going back through many of his interviews he gave at OR, ORI University. And um, I dug really, really as far as I could into his concepts on telepresence. And I have to admit um, that they are a little dated for the time period. But uh, they're not wrong. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest things that caught my ear was that his idea of using robotic craft is a lot like, I'm going to paraphrase it, out of fear of the copyright gods. And uh, just, just paraphrase a little bit here of that the spirit can travel at the speed of light and is truly indestructible. And that there's a new paradigm shift on how humans will be acting as if they are in a present place. His idea of this telepresence is, is a lot like the dreams we have in the VR, AR, and mixed reality, and now let's add spatial computing to that list, community. And um, I don't think that VR and AR is not... It's not quite there yet as a replacement for certain experiences and tasks. Per se, in the normal world, if I wanted to feel the feeling of kicking a soccer ball across the field to someone else, or fly in a hot air balloon, it's never going to feel exactly the same as just going and doing it. And the safety envelope of those type of things is just pretty good. I mean, there is some extreme examples, but... If you do your due diligence and you, you plan it out well and you, you pick the right time and you're not out there in a lightning storm kicking that soccer ball and you're not in a really bad weather environment, you're probably going to be fine in that hot air balloon, especially if it's a short trip with somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, you'll, you'll probably be fine. Um, don't come crying to me if something happens, but that's part of life. You know, we take these limited risks to feel to feel what it is to be truly human and explore something new and have passion. And once again, that's what interests me the most about Bob Ballard's positions on using less and less manned craft under the oceans. Because he does have the passion. He it truly shines through even to this day on, on his love of exploring these places. Yet he doesn't want to go down himself anymore. And he doesn't want anyone else to either, uh, whenever possible. And I think that's because with uh, these tele, we'll, we'll use his term. I'm going to try to keep the entire frame of this discussion around telepresence and ignore some of the more recent stuff, but b try to bring those more recent things to telepresence instead of trying to overwrite telepresence out of um, in dangerous environments and has hazardous environments, it makes sense to use 
unmanned vehicles, whether it's under the oceans, in the skies, or on the ground. It makes a lot of sense. And furthermore, you can have experiences you would never willingly do and still be able to walk away and be able to collect data and develop new experiences without any risks. So the limitations of current manned systems underwater, once again, going back to the core of the telepresence uh, concept, is, is really simple. Um, <laughs> underwater stuff is hard, and it may be a simple concept, but it's really hard to prepare for. Most craft that are successful utilize very heavy elements that are magnetic and require special kinds of foam to become neutrally buoyant. Based on the research that I'm, I'm not an underwear expert, but based on multiple articles I pulled up and some of the discussions with some of the experts who have built these craft that have been successful. Um, now, out of these limitations, you result in one obvious issue. You can't see through metal. So what you have are these environments that are extremely dangerous, that require a material you can't see through. And what do you do? Well, you add holes to the side of the craft. Yes, I'm being serious. They're, they're your windows. Without windows, it might as well not even go down, unless you're relying on cameras. And if you're just relying on cameras, if you can get good enough latency and if you can get enough video feeds, you might as well just stay on top and not have a human in there. So in the early days, they didn't have that opportunity to say as much. The HD cameras didn't exist, and there was a significant issues with feeds. And if the feed cuts out, it does, how, how does automation work back in the 1960s, 70s, etc.? Uh, slowly but surely, that's changing, though. More on that in a little, just a moment. But uh, limitations on current man systems mean that there's these tiny little portholes, basically. Extremely thick, really redundant, really good uh, build-out portholes, but they're just portholes. And because of that, it's not like you're going down as a human being. You're going down as a tube, a very engineered, overbuilt tube. And once again, as a layman, not an expert on submersibles, never been in a submersible, bare, I, I did two scuba, two scuba experiences in my life less than 100 feet deep. Um, I can tell you that uh, it does not seem like the greatest experience. It's very hard to keep them warm. It is not very large. Uh, bathroom breaks are not exactly easy or comfortable or pleasant around other people. And uh, it takes hours and hours to get back and up and up and down, especially due to the human nature and the speed of these craft and how they rely on systems that are energy efficient, let's say, but they are not fast and have to deal with a tremendous amount of environmental factors. If it's too risky, you can't go down. So, with all that said, there are significant limitations on current manned systems. This is the environment that made, I, I believe, my opinion now, Ballard step back and say, there's got to be a better way. And additionally, the other side of the coin is, in the ex examples such as the Titanic and other underwater targets, how do you get inside without being entangled? Another famous underwater explorer in, a, in, an other, in a different interview discussed, uh, Jim Cameron, uh, discussed the dangers of becoming entangled underwater are far greater than the actual vessels themselves failing. And it is the number one fear they have, especially when they're solo. An underwater submersible that is remotely operated suddenly allows you to be another pair of eyes, suddenly might be able to bring a tool down or something else that can assist with getting clear of the, that, that situation. Uh, Cameron in that interview directly cited an example of a pair of submersibles communicating with each other in order to get the first one free. And it would have been a very dangerous situation or, or a possible loss of craft if it did not happen which has never happened in the history of the programs until recent events, which I will not weigh in on. So uh, it brings up some interesting topic on the telepresence thing, the VR advantages. What is the disadvantage? 
Well, if you're running a VR experience of any kind, this is something I actually do have experience with, uh, latency is a killer. So if you are doing a VR experience and there's multiple miles between you and the device you're working, it would probably need, at minimum, reliably would want to have a fiber optic link, like a, a cable, a giant cable that is running back and forth. And then the ca I don't mean cable has to be thick. I don't mean the cable has to be expensive, although it does pay to have a lot of material protecting it and multiple redundant feeds inside that cable. Uh, but you need to go back to Ballard's point, spirit that can travel at the speed of light and is indestructible. Well, that cable's not indestructible, but I can tell you that if you have good obstacle avoidance and if you have some luck <laughs> and uh, some other fun things, you should be okay with a tethered operation for most needs. Um, I do think that there is significant integration challenges trying to bring in a VR experience, but I believe it is the end game for any of these topics. Because if you have a robot and it just has a camera strapped to the top or even multiple cameras and you're staring at some flat panel monitors, the immersion factor is just not going to be there. Ballard's final vision of telepresence is like as if the arm of the rover is your hand picking something up. His vision is that you should feel it's imperceptible, the difference between your own body and the craft itself. He even in one interview brings up the idea of Navi <laughs> from the fictional uh, worlds that James Cameron came up with uh, <laughs> for the Avatar series of movies, which... Once again, I would love to show you video from, but I am terrified of copyrights. So um, if somebody ever wants to voluntarily just coach me through a little bit of that, I've done some research, but every single video I see that does research on it basically says, yeah, this is relevant as of this date. And by the way, anytime YouTube can change their mind and give you a copyright strike. So uh, fair use terrifies me, <laughs> especially for longer clips or something like that, more than like six seconds. But um, let's talk for a minute about that idea of having this imperceptible connection. I've had many experiences in VR. I've a couple times, uh, twice. I've fallen asleep in VR and woken up in it. Once I was actually genuinely was confused and literally thought I was in uh, some type of second nature, some type of life, the my, my real life. And the other time I was not tricked at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the system desynced. It was clearly a, a jumble of, of an avatar laying on the floor. And um, I can tell you that it is a jarring experience being removed from VR after you've been connected. It is a weird feeling. I've had plenty of times when my old Vive, before I got my index, my, my OG Vive would tear and desync and fall apart on me and i had to get over it and um if here's where we get into this if you had this concept of telepresence where it's imperceptible a person feels like they're they're flying in this craft and honestly i have some thoughts on how you could do that um I'll throw them in here. Yeah, this is kind of a freeform video to see if people are interested in me doing more research-based videos on these type of topics, covering like these, uh, I'll call them like these, 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 these heavyweights, their time. And um, to me, Ballard is, 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 is a pioneer and that's a good thing and a bad thing because he was kind of ahead of his curve. He really, really made his mark and, um, I have some other thoughts about like what, what he was up to and things on some of his missions and stuff, and they're very fascinating. But honestly, the man is nearly an open book on everything he is allowed to talk about, and he is a fascinating fella. I highly recommend checking out the sources I have in the description, by the way. They're going to be pretty heavy on this video. But uh, on this video specifically, um, where do I want to take this? A freeform video I get to have fun with. I get to talk about the concepts and come trying to bring them into the VR landscape. Yeah. So 
my thoughts are very simple. I don't know how to build an ROV, but I bothered to look up enough underwater ROVs to figure out that this is how you build an underwater ROV. And um, the ROV crafts are rather small compared to the man craft, and they are designed, and the words of the people that were literally being discussed with this, interviewed, and um, some, of the, some of the paperwork I've read, um, they're designed to go down for long periods of time. They are designed to rest on the bottom where they, uh, they, they so to speak, land. Uh, they tend to be lighter than the mancraft, and they can kind of perch and land in different locations to save battery and save resources on board, and they can move around. However, it is extremely cold underwater. You have environmental factors, such as the literal fish and other things like that. You have materials on the bottom that are constantly settling, uh, that dust that is kicked up when these things move around. So obviously there is limitations to them. But they can go down for, there's no risk of oxygen running out. Um, there's no risk of CO building up. So without those human factors, the only factors that you really have to worry about aside from the mechanical ones I just discussed is like, how does the experience feel? If it feels like junk, no one's going to want to do it, to be simple about this. Now, one of the factors that I believe is important is that interfacing experience. And it's, once again, something I have rather extensive experience as being as being a community VR developer since 2017. I, I want to try to stick to my strengths and talk to you about that. I believe that the, the ROV's looks don't matter. I believe it should have a walking mode. So yes, it has might have to squeeze into different areas, but the person who is wearing the VR headset uh, should perceive it as an avatar. So if it has an arm or two on board, it is simulating those arms. If it has to tuck up into a tight spot, the computer that is rendering out what the, what, what the experience down below is compared to what the person up top is perceiving, um, it should show like a person, like a, an avatar ducking into that location. Now, here, here's the thing. This might be a little controversial. I believe there should be a tandem pair of people. One person operating the video payloads and guiding the craft like as if they're a person exploring the wreck. And then a safety person whose only job is to view the raw feed and also make sure that the mission parameters are being accomplished. Think of it like a person that is being uh, sent in to go let's say, work work a task. And then the other person's like the foreman that checks on their tasks and make sure, make sure they're good to go, make sure they're comfortable, make sure they don't need a relief person. And it also op opens up another opportunity in this structure for multiple ROVs, teams of full divers, where you have like one person who's constantly monitoring the tasks, constantly monitoring the raw feeds and making sure that they're not messing up or getting in the way of something, where the rest of the people are literally feeling like they're people on the bottom of the ocean. They're all wearing their headsets, they're communicating, they're working together, there's a connection between them, there's constant calculations going on to try to prevent the, the, uh, the strands to disconnect from each other. And eventually, ideally, there would be a repeater network so you would send down a fiber optic system with a device on the bottom of it. And that would act as like your back and forth piece that the, that the teams would go up and down to get back to the mothership. And they would be wireless down there. Now, here's where I think this really gets fun. If you're on the bottom of the ocean, there is a rather wide latitude of different frequencies you can work on. Now, I'm not saying go mess with the whale's <laughs> communications. I'm not saying go mess with the Navy's submarines or something. But I guarantee you there's plenty of frequencies that could be explored. And you could suddenly have large teams that are what I call full dive telepresent VR. And they could do some pretty incredible things. You could have a team that's constantly going inside the, the, the underwater target and the other team acting as their safeties that are constantly monitoring from the outside, bringing them materials, bringing them tools. 
every single ROV craft having the same multi-configured arms that can con can use multiple different types of cutting tools, that can use tools with, with different maybe payloads, maybe a LiDAR scanner, for example, and some other things. And they can all communicate. And all these people would be in the same teams live in the same room up top. Now, there is um, a very big elephant in the room. First of all, I am no expert on underwater craft. Um, I, I fully admit that. I'm only offering you use cases and user perspective on VR integration into this concept. But my vision would be teams that descend into a site and can quickly be deployed. And this brings up a really interesting discussion. During my research, I found that there was multiple underwater craft that could have had survivors, and in one or two cases, they did have survivors on board well after the, the ship was on the bottom, especially when it wasn't as deep as the Titanic. Even though the Titanic is about the average depth of the entire ocean, there are still places that do not have anywhere near that depth where they are too deep for normal divers to go. And being able to rapidly deploy these teams of these mini ROVs that can go in and go hunt down things and find survivors, find things, find uh, evidence as quickly as possible, get into sensitive craft and get rid of that sensitive stuff of whatever it is. Um, if the craft has a large amount of fuel on board or some other hazardous resource, find out what it is and try to fix it or find out what we need to fix it. They could be the first step in a much larger program to step up, especially in like the, uh, the ships that have sunk in ports. Um, I, I see the future as, as, as open as can be. And I think that this idea of telepresence really works well. The idea of being able to take someone's spirit, their soul, and communicate it into an environment that you literally are not supposed to go is fascinating to me. And I think it has legs. I think it has a future. And um, there's a lot of universities that have written a lot about it already. And <laughs> I'm once again focusing um, in this very free form uh, uh, discussion on the topic. And uh, in my knowledge, virtual reality, MR, AR, spatial computing, if Apple gets their way, uh, topic, because it's all mixed together now. So let's do a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, an SWOT analysis on full dive telepresent virtual technology. We're treating this like as if we're going to do it tomorrow. And, you know, we, we are starting a process tomorrow and we're going to start building these craft. We're going to start uh, trying to integrate craft that already exist into a heavy VR systems and um, simulating like as if you're a human being look able to turn side to side. What, what would it look like? And one last thing before we get into the SWAT. Um, in virtual reality, one of the most critical things, aside from controlling yourself, your, your movements yourself, so you don't get, you don't get sick, more on that in the weaknesses. Um, one last critical mention here. Uh, the use of stitched together video computing. So a 360 camera basically would be mission critical for this. You would need to have high definition video that is in all directions around the craft. That could, that could actually be accomplished by just four cameras that are designed to go down to these depths that already exist. And um, basically when the VR user puts on their headset and they look to the left or look to the right, there is no camera moving. It is literally just you're looking and then it moves across the field of view to the next camera over to the next camera over to look behind you, et cetera, et cetera. That is at with, with very wide fields of view so you can look up and look down as well. That is absolutely critical uh, for this to work. Uh, and I did not see any craft that have that capability already, but I did see plenty of technology on older, older craft um, that are getting closer and closer, it feels like, to slapping on enough equipment to do something like that. So, into the SWAT uh, for the full dive telepresent virtual technology and virtual reality. The strengths here is that we're talking about maturing technology infrastructure. ROVs are nothing new. And having more and more technology that's getting more and more simplified, cheaper, and more uh, capable, and you can build redundancies into, 
is, is great. Additionally, on the VR side, we have computers that can have 64 cores, 128 threads that you can run off a simple desktop for under 10 grand, 10,000 USD, something like that. Um, you can basically have the equivalent of what used to be a supercomputer just a few years ago, and you can have it sitting inside that ship. And if you wanted to do a satellite link, apologies for the lightning in a moment. Uh, if you wanted to do a satellite link when there's no lightning <laughs> to like, say, a low earth orbit satellite mesh network, um, you could do it. You absolutely could. And it would, the latency would be worse, much worse. But if you had enough computing going on on the end of the fiber that's on the ship and the person that's controlling it is on, say, a, a control center that's on ground somewhere else or in another ship or something like that, um, I don't think it would be impossible, especially for an experienced person that's used to the latency. Additionally, there are a lot of tricks you can use where, we, where there can be you can take and remove what's called black frames in and out of the feed. And there are a few other little tricks that we can change to make it feel less juddery and make it still feel real enough. Real enough is the key words here. And once again, the whole idea of stitching together multiple cameras without having a PTZ style camera, pan tilt zoom camera, having to turn is very critical, even more so when you're talking about any additional latency on just the feed alone um, between what you're doing. Additionally, I'm going to state the obvious here. But once you're down at a wreck or a target site and you're working, if you just slow the heck down, <laughs> um, it'll make it a lot easier on you uh, to try to feel like you're actually there and not take you out of it just because you whipped around a little too fast and the thing doesn't didn't catch up in time. <laughs> just stating the obvious there. And one other topic, sorry again for the lightning. I've been trying to delay this video for hours and hours and hours to get past it, but... We've had storms for, I don't know, since like noon. So I'm not waiting more than 12 hours to try to do something. Now, if we were to include strengths even further, we could talk about the proven traditions and an unmet need that would be met uh, by this capability. And the elephant in the room here is tourism alongside exploration. And... I would say that uh, it comes down to a very simple factor here. Once again, going back to the spirit of Ballard's telepresence concepts and why he is so excited about that, about Hercules and his other ROVs, is, is very simple here. Looking through a tiny little porthole and sharing that view with multiple other people is not as great as being able to feel like you are there. If you can meet that need and you can follow the proven technologies that are already there so you can reliably get down there, and this isn't like a fly-by-night operation, people will flock to it. The, the massive capabilities of the newer VR technology and the safety gains are absolutely un... un, un, un <sighs> unignorable there are some sure many situations where mancraft would be necessary but even in those situations i could see these type of systems complementing that mancraft or at the very least going ahead of it and scouting out especially at a new wreck site if a large I'm not wishing this on anybody but if a new if, if a cruise ship went down let's let's pick a happy scenario a cruise ship suddenly crashed and everybody got off in it. Everybody's okay. Dot, dot, dot. There are, let's say, four other cruise ships of that exact same class and scale and size. And we need to know why it went down. And we didn't get enough information. Sending down these craft ahead of a manned craft expedition would make sense. If anything, just to confirm the safety of the, of, of, of the direction you're heading into. Once again, I'm no expert, but I can use my head and realize it's why risk a person when you can risk an ROV. I may regret those words someday. Uh, with the way things are going with LLMs and the eventual AI, LLMs not AI, but eventually who knows what it'll lead to. I may eat those words, but for now, 
uh, robotic craft are, are, are friends and they are willing to risk themselves. And also, as a side note, even though these things are very expensive, if you lose one, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's a lot easier to recover something that doesn't have to breathe. So it can stay down there for a month until you're ready to grab it and then you can go get it and save it. <laughs> So that's another thing. Maybe that's my one way of getting out of angering the robotic world. <laughs> um, I have a lot of admiration for the engineering and the capabilities of these craft, and I do have a passion for robotics, but uh, it's an expensive hobby um, unless you're getting paid to do it. <laughs> okay, speaking of paid, one of the big weaknesses of any new technology being merged with an older technology is funding. It's very easy to look at the back of a truck or a ship or a warehouse and point at something and say, well, you already have this and we spent millions on that. Why do we need these new things? And I would contend that even with the more affordable nature of a ROV, especially not necessarily when we're talking about multiple of them, like I am, but um, it's going to be very hard to overcome that situation. Additionally, there's a tech debt. So there is a merging of technologies that needs to happen between the VR, AR, mixed and spatial computing world and this new concept of bringing it into the fold of a, well, what's a maturing technology infrastructure. How does it work with these systems? I can't just plug Steam VR or the newest version of Quest... <laughs> systems for the meta systems into uh the needs of this system it's going to need some type of stitching done much like the video renders video systems are going to need i'm going to need a lot of work done on getting these together the good news is there is plenty more developers moving into this space into the vr generalized space and I don't see that calming down. If anything, especially with Apple's more recent technologies, I see it as, as speeding up. And it may pop again, but I would see it as a great advantage at the moment to rely on those technologies and bring them in. Additionally, bring in the experienced people from the submersibles communities and the exploration communities and the res search and rescue communities and uh, bringing in the experts uh, from these teams. Um, I, I, I could, without a doubt, uh, see that they could come up with something together. And this is where this gets kind of difficult. Um, there is a, just like in, just like there is sea legs on the ships of these, of these motherships, there is VR legs. Um, it is a well-documented situation, although there's no official term for it that I know of, but in the VR community, we call it VR legs. It, it was originally coined, uh, by Up Is Not Jump, uh, one, one, of, one of my favorite uh, developers slash modders slash uh, content creators for VR. And one of the things about his work is establishing this concept of VR legs is probably one of the most, it's probably going to outlast him, honestly, that concept. But it's the idea that when you get used to VR, there is certain unspoken realities that you have to overcome. Your mind has to wrap its head around virtual reality and accept it. And not everyone can, especially in high motion games, especially in games that rely on what is called locomotion, where you physically have to point at a general spot and then click and let go, and then it teleports you to that, that location. Uh, those type of things are extremely jarring for people. And it especially applies in tight environments. Here's where I'm going with all this. On a ship, there's only so much space. In proper VR, the, the vision people have is being able to physically walk around a room, and it's the room. There's a chaperone system, usually with a lighthouse infrastructure in place in the corners of the room, and when you walk around the room, it detects where you look, where you walk, where, you, where your body goes, and you can even do full body tracking with legs and arms. But the problem is not everybody has a huge room to operate out of. And on a ship, especially when you have a whole team of people going down, you will suddenly need to put those people well planted in its small spaces or have a completely redesigned infrastructure in place on the mothership where there's multiple smaller rooms that they operate on or 
even explore the ever memeish I'll use that word, dare I say it, uh, idea of using these uh, track environments. Like people walk on these these treadmills that go in multiple directions or they put on special shoes that have to be their exact size and they roll around on the metal. It, it, it's, it's, it's not good. It's getting somewhere. Somewhere someday that may be a thing, really cool thing, but um, it ain't great. It ain't great. If it was great, I'd already have one, <laughs> one of those treadmills. But um, I can tell you that even with a decent sized room that I've had to carve out for just uh, keeping spaced out for VR with a single user, I can tell you that it is extremely. You could have you. I, I could have it. I could have an airplane hanger, and I'd still want more space. I'd still find an excuse or way to need more space, um, especially games where you have to take a knee or they're, or full body tracking in VR when you're trying to dance or something like that. Um, I don't see it as any different in these submersibles. I see it as slower motion, but there will be issues. And there are wires, unfortunately. Um, there's two issues here. One, if there's multiple headsets, you have the risk of interference, even if there's multiple channels involved and you split them up. And two, there's battery packs involved if they are truly wireless. Now, you could have wireless where the sense of like they're sitting on um, specialized chairs and the chair itself you plug the headset into. And then that would be really neat because then you could rapidly unplug and plug these upfit into these upfit chairs, different headsets. And that would be interesting to me, but it doesn't help with the whole idea of VR legs. Once again, if you're not physically walking around, it, there's a big learning curve, especially if you're being thrown into a more uh, risky environment. You're risking a craft that could be well, who knows how much money. Um, it will take time, and there is going to be that learning curve that some people may not appreciate. Um I could also see the safety officers being frustrated because they're seeing the pure, unfiltered vision, n not necessarily the cleaned up version that's supposed to make you feel like you're walking around, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they may be frustrated calling out safety concerns and then trying to show it. They'll probably need a big red button that they literally press, like they hold it down, and that specific person in the room now sees the raw, unfiltered view without the avatar or overlay, without certain other things that make it more comfortable, etc. And they're just seeing the raw feed. And then they take their hand off the big red button for that user and that chair, etc. Uh, in order to uh, get back into that environment. And that would take a little bit of time. It would be probably a huge uh, uh, freak out experience to some people of suddenly being ripped out of something that they feel like they're there at. Uh, for their own sake and for the sake of the craft. And um, I would say that another weakness is the lack of risk is more risk uh, to Rex. So the targets down below um, will probably have a few of these unfortunately stuck in them. Now, they are kind of a self-serving, pro self-solving problem in the sense that more of them could go in and rescue the one that's stuck and get it out of there. But there may be some that just get wedged in the wrong spot and... You don't want to go breaking out some type of um, dis d disruptive technology to, to be able to rip it out of there or cut it out of there or something without that because you don't want to damage the historical nature of the, of the target. Um, I, I could definitely see a lack of risk, especially if tourism is involved, especially if some of the more heavy duty uses beyond exploration, there are commercial and industrial uses that would certainly be a little more rough around the edges. I think of the oil fields and some of the other technologies where they're just evaluating the bottom of oil wrecks and so, uh, the, the oil derricks. Uh, I want to be very specific with my words here. I'm not insulting the oil community. Um, and I could also see them uh, taking risks with those devices um, that they already are using. Uh, but even more so now that they're in that VR experience and it just feels like, oh, I could just go over there. I could just do this. And... Um, now the craft is stuck or it caused more trouble than it was worth. So I do see those as weaknesses and I don't want them to start feeling like they are uh, toys on the bottom of the ocean, but I could definitely see the telepresence. And at the end of the day, it's a piece of technology that gives you a ton of opportunities. It's not the fault of the technology if somebody misuses it. 
And I think that the exploration of the oceans is an important part of our world. You know, 70 plus percent of the entire earth is underwater. It deserves to be seen. Humans deserve to get to see it. And we deserve to know what's down there and know more about everything about our world. Uh, I think that language learning model integration, LLMs, alongside the earlier, I kind of took the cat out of the bag on mesh networks. I mentioned them earlier. Once again, I really apologize for the lightning, but I've just given up. I waited 12 hours to do this video, and I, I just, I wanted to get these thoughts off my chest before I just give up and I don't put this video, I don't put this thoughts out, out there in the ether. I'd love to do some deeper digging on these specific topics around this if people find interest in it. Um, we'll see. So uh, one of the interesting things about mesh networks in general when you combine them with LLMs is that if you have a situation where, say, a node gets taken out when I'm my wireless concept, um, the mothership drops the node down to the bottom. The node is feeding the wireless feeds to all the headsets, and then the, the node is feeding via fiber back up to the mothership, right? Uh, if, let's say, something heavy falls on the node, or the node simply fails, salt water inundates it when it's not supposed to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it breaks it. Um, the LLM capabilities should be able to help the craft problem solve even in the worst scenarios. So there should be a fail save. If there is no signal fed within 10 minutes, the craft automatically start finding their way out. They start retracing their breadcrumbs all the way back out. If there's two craft both trying to exit the same hole at the same moment, they are able to figure out which one is the, is the first through the hole and which one's the second one. And then they can communicate back and forth on a local network to be able to talk to each other and be able to communicate, hey, I just went out that hole, and then the current that's in this part of the ocean just forced me into the silt. Don't come through that. Like, these type of things are some of the interesting technologies we could explore and develop with LLMs. And this can all be done from a group of college students. They can be sitting cozy with, with their slippers on in their labs, working on these things and, and handling the LLM side of the house. Once again, taking... The field reports, taking the expert expert opinions of the past explorers and, and, and other people who work under the water, and then also combining that with the newest technologies with LLM. Now, this is not without its issues. Um, I should have put that in weaknesses as well. It's like I added LLM, so I might as well mention it in weaknesses. Uh, we, LLMs currently are very prone to hallucinations, so you would need to have constant review of what they're doing. They would need to be as basic as possible. And once again, this is a failsafe. This is supposed to be like we've lost control of the craft. It's going to try its best, maybe to 20% battery or 30% battery. It'll try to get itself out of this location before its fuel cell fails or something. Um, and then it goes in a dormant mode, so it has at least some few, some uh, energy left. So if we do get the node reactivated or we send a secondary auxiliary node, um, these craft can then utilize that instead of relying on the LLM, which might be risky. LLMs do something called uh, hallucination, and the ones I've been playing with over the past few months are prone to this as well, where they basically lie and they think they're telling the truth. It's not their fault. They're, they're flawed things, and they need to be developed better. And they need to have a guidance from humans to be able to help them with this. And they're, in general, to be honest right now, should not be trusted with anything too important. Um, they should be more of assistive technologies, helping a person plan out things quickly. And then that person that knows what they're doing, that, that person who asked it to do it, or another person double checks all of those things before it's conducted and committed to. Um, but if you have technology like LLM being utilized to try to figure out ways to find its way out of a location or communicate with each other to do basic instructions on how to, okay, one, two, three, four, and five are all going to go through this area one at a time so we don't all just squeeze in and break break <laughs> the entire setup inside the, inside the ship uh, forever and ever be stuck here. Um, I see them as a very useful tool. It is not what they're meant to be used for, but plenty of people are using them to take information that is gathered from sensors and then act on that information through different measures. So being able to uh, follow their breadcrumb trail back through an area 
probably using sensors, at least in real life, uh, not in the deep oceans and uh, extreme examples of that, you know, type of SLAM imp implementation what comes to mind, where they, they literally are visually recording all along the way all the little different objects that are in different hallways, that are in different places. They don't know it's a hallway. But they do know that I went by this blue object that's faded blue with silt all over it on the right um, about two minutes ago. So if I follow every single thing, I'll be good to go. So that's uh, where I'm at right now on this. And uh, LLM integration would be very interesting to me. You have search and rescue and resource development. That's another opportunity. I see these craft being miniaturized and miniaturized and miniaturized and brought down to a safety envelope that is reasonable enough that they could be deployed from a large, uh, a large aircraft and in the future be able to have like a floating a raft that is deployed from an aircraft and then these things come down off of there and the raft acts as a temporary mothership during an emergency. A plane can fly somewhere anywhere around the world in 12 to 12, 24 hours. Ships take too long to get places during search and rescue operations underwater. So uh, these could definitely help in a lot of circumstances and in potentially resolve conflicts, both political, economic issues, uh, resolve these things quickly and to a point, have knowledge on, on, on scene and, and be maybe not expendable, but a resource that is, that is a commodity that can be deployed at any time. And it'll get, the information is so critical that it, it is necessary for this to be happen very quickly. And in general, yes, if we lose it, we lose it, uh, to the rough oceans. Um, you know, and, and it may be something that is not possible. Once again, I'm not an expert in these fields, but I can see some of these little, these little hints of something more. And I understand where they want to go with it. The golden age of Earth exploration is upon us. I think especially underwater technologies like this will certainly help us explore and better understand our Earth and model it in every way imaginable. And honestly, I, I can't think of a cooler thing to be a part of. And I think with VR being involved, we all can be. Because to me, it's not a... Okay, I'm going to catch some flack for this. But only a few people get to fly these things. Only a few people get to drive these things, whatever you want to call it. But everybody, if you release it to the public, can then experience it. With VR becoming more and more impre more and more commonplace, so your VR, AR, <sighs> mixed and spatial computing, whatever you want to call it, whatever experience you want to do, whatever headset they they, they want to sell you, um, if it can take a common experience and show you it in that VR atmosphere, guess what? You can now be feel like you're there. So suddenly, a fifth grader in Iowa can suddenly go explore the Titanic and what's left of it and understand it better of what happened. It can, you, a person who is a researcher in Sweden can suddenly know what uh, the bottom of, of what is supposed to look like when a ship is actually stable and is supposed to be this way. Uh, when, when, it, when, it, when it goes down, they can then take that model and go, okay, the, uh, the new Panamax container vessel that went down uh, right off our coast, I just pulled the files for one that, that was partial, it was fully intact, that was not sunk, <laughs> and now I can compare the two. And I can take the models from this and the models from that, and I can put them together. And if I don't have that capability, I can ship these data off to another facility who can commonly understand everything I'm sending them in, in, in the United States. And suddenly, bam, you can work this together. Uh, the spatial computing concepts are exciting. And I mean, they're mind boggling. They're mind opening in every which way you can imagine. It's not about who gets the data. It's about that the data is available and it's available once again, within reason. Obviously there are commercial, governmental, industrial, you know, uh, 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 trade secrets and secrets that must be preserved for this, for safety and such. But 
outside of that, I'm picking on just the safety aspects, the exploration aspects, the igniting of an entire new generation of people into robotics. Um, there's a lot of value there. There's a lot of value there. And um, we're just not seeing it yet, unfortunately. You know, um, I don't think that everybody is going to want to go under the ocean, even in VR. But the people that can, these technology will allow them to. And people that aren't, the hundreds of thousands more will be able to appreciate it. Millions more eventually uh, will be able to appreciate it in a consumable environment. And nobody says that can't be monetized, by the way. There's no, there's no rule saying you can't have some reasonable monetization to it unless it's government funded, et cetera, et cetera, and whatever that means. But yeah, golden age of Earth exploration. Um, I, 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 I envy the next generations because some of the things that they will be able to just on a board Friday night be able to go check out with their friends on, in, in these atmospheres, in these experiences, like as if they're there is going to be incredible. I really do envy them. Uh, finally, threats. A new space race. So control of the oceans is a big part of who gets to run trade in the world. There's a lot of political and other implications. I'll leave it at that. Um, I would say that uh, these craft are very exciting and having these mesh networks of full dive te telepresent virtual reality systems complete with LLM integration um, can be used for good or, or bad. Um, I think that uh, countries that want to maintain trade and keep an open world um, for those things and keep a, keep a fair world uh, need to focus on the, their energies on this, and I'll leave it at that. Um, once again, I am not an expert on any of these things. Questionable ethics, salvage, and ocean exploitation. One of the other threats is that we will have issues with ethical use of these things because the pe not necessarily the people getting experiences and monetizing those experiences, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking more about physically it's going to be easier to send massive amounts of craft in different places, easily move them around the world, and suddenly there will be, uh, let's choose my words carefully here, very carefully, a sudden ability to go into targets under the ocean and exploit them very easily. Suddenly ships that were deep can be chopped into and work through and quickly and effectively and no, no longer is it a niche market uh, to have a submersible capability. Um, you have a mini set of craft that can suddenly work together in tandem and within a week strip a ship down to its bones and take every ounce of whatever material it has on board or whatever it has secrets-wise. Um, there's a lot of questionable ethics there. Um, also the issue of, to a lesser extent, but there is an issue of tourism, manipulating historical sites to look cooler is, is something we've seen on the, on, on, <laughs> in places you can breathe, <laughs> places that are more hospitable to humans. Um, and suddenly if there is a massive interest in these new technologies and getting people down into these places, uh, it will not be unheard of to set the wreck, so to speak. A lot of these wrecks do not look the way they do. The Titanic, for example, based on my research of other people's research that were far more courageous than I am, uh, found that they basically the whole back aft of the of the craft uh, had the equivalent of a jet turbine of water was the description they offered, uh, clearing out the wooden um, the wooden walls and just blowing them apart. There's nothing left, but. At some of these sites, maybe not necessarily as, 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 as famous as the Titanic, but at some of these sites that are going to be newly available uh, to take uh, tourists to or create experiences for to a much lesser extent, um, you will suddenly have issues of people perhaps bringing their own bones, bringing their own cherished items, we'll call them, and uh, setting the wreck, repainting the wreck for the wrong reasons. Um, there is discussion about wreck preservation, which is one of the cool things that I, once again, back to Ballard, uh, he talked about, was talking about um, 
preventing Rex from splaying where the rivets would rot off and literally fall off of the ship enough where the, literally the ship is unrecognizable and falls apart even from when it, its wreck is recognizable, no longer be recognizable um, because it literally fell apart into the silt. Um, that's, yeah, uh, that sounds very interesting to me, very exciting. But uh, when it comes to people doing it for the wrong reasons, um, that worries me manipulating the wrecks not for preservation but manipulating them for uh tourism is a deep concern i think that everybody should have the whole point is to explore these things and find our history and human nature and well sometimes human nature comes with you and i do see that as a threat the more of this technology is used the more there is risk to be used in the wrong ways so yeah, I, once again, I want to addendum this. These are all my own opinions. They are not the opinions of any organization. They are, I am not an expert in underwater <laughs> submersible technologies. Um, I have tr attempted to leverage my personal experiences with VR and the all of the different mixed reality capabilities. And which since 2017, um, and develop that into how would I apply those to this concept of Bob Ballard's telepresence. And I got to say, I see a lot of promise in it. I see a lot of capabilities. And I see this as a nascent technology that is kind of sitting in its own little niche. And it, it suddenly has a blinding hot spotlight pointed at it right now due to current events un for unfortunate reasons. And I hope that you know, some of these technologies that he and many other experts in their field are, are describing are, are viewed seriously and, and they are developed better. I hope they see a future because there is a lot here that can be explored. And I got to tell you that it would be really interesting. And I'm barely scraping the surface. Some of the stuff I would love to talk about is uh, putting in sensors on the, on the ocean floor, being able to walk the floor during uh before sorry before uh, uh earthquakes and such and make and building entire sensor nets in the rim of fire uh, that was one thing i left off of here because i didn't really have much else to say other than just how cool that would be <laughs> but um these are things that you can suddenly do when you're not spending just an hour or two if you're lucky on the bottom of the ocean and spending hours and hours and hours trying to get up and get back down and do it all safe and running hours and hours of safety precautions and measurements just to do those two hour trips and then also by the way you got to sleep at some point so another team has to go down and do that so you can see like the use of these experts and the technologies is very limited one last thought i have this telepresence and the full dive telepresent virtual reality concepts will generate an immense amount of data, far, far more than the HD, uh, what was that, 3,000 to 10,000 photos and building products that they did digital scans recently, the Titanic that took years to make, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we already have ways to stitch together photography and do LIDAR scans and such. Now, I will addendum that with, I don't know how the heck lasers work on the bottom of the ocean. I'm sure smarter people than me have thought that through pretty dang well um, for many good reasons and bad. But um, what I can say is, um, I don't mean bad, bad. I just mean like in fun ways, you know, just like a topic. <laughs> but um, I can say that you can do it with high definition photography, especially once that silt calms down. They've already proven it themselves by doing this technology and running through entire grid scans and mapping. They've been mapping for, I think it's close to two decades now. They've been talking about how they do high definition mapping. They just got better and better and better at it. But building these products and being able to do them within days, not years, would be very important. And that once again goes back to the one small team on the boat, on the ship, I should say, out of respect. Um, is, is, is an important member of the of the team, but more importantly, there are going to be hundreds of people and lots of computing power in data centers around the world that would be pulling upon this data and really picking it apart and finding it and building it into products that you can actually use into experiences for VR. Um, if you feed enough of this data through and people can easily get access to it and at least lightly be able to monetize it, with, with respect to the original makers um, or the original organizations that paid for it, um, 
I think you could really build some solid partnerships and build an entire new generation of modelers that would create these products for everyone to experience. You know, the, the, the equivalent of like a digital Britannica that could suddenly be put together and a digital encyclopedia that could suddenly be experienced by everyone for a very affordable price. And I, I got to tell you, uh, it's an exciting future. I envy them because eventually we'll figure it out. That's all I got for now. Thank you to my long subscribers for putting up with me. <laughs> And thank you to all of you listening uh, for putting up with me on this long form story uh, through the, tel the vision of telepresence and does it have a place in the modern world with a fan from Bob Ballard. I have a lot of respect for Robert Ballard. Uh, he's a child of hero of mine and his entire team. I feel like I've gotten to know them a little bit the past few days watching a lot of the documentaries with, with a lot of them. And I got to tell you, uh, I, if any of you ever managed to hear this, thank you for all the work you've done and all the work you continue to do. And to the new generations, more power to you. If you got anything out of this, please drop a comment. Let me know what you thought. Even if it's just words of encouragement, it's always appreciated. Or if you don't want to do that, I'm not, it's not that I'm just rooting for, uh, for, for uh, people to show how great I am. You can always reach out to me on Discord privately. Red.j. That's my new Discord name. <laughs> it's the same Discord. They made me change it uh, due to the new naming nomenclature. <laughs> First time in many years. Just one more reminder. Opinions are my own. They are not meant part of any organization. I am speculating here. There is no information here that is not outside of open source intelligence.